My name is Eric Osiakwan, and I'm from Ghana, which is one of the 54 countries that make up Africa. Before I start, I want to just do a reality check. Anybody in the audience that think Africa is a country, not a continent? <laughs> just, just trying to be sure. Okay, so this is great. Uh, we're on the same page. So I'm going to tell you certain things about Africa that will probably be in your blind spot. The first is the size of Africa. Do you know that Africa is so huge that you can fit the United States in West Africa, China, Asia, and still have room for India and Japan? Yes, that's how big Africa is. Africa is so huge. Currently, Africa has a population of a billion. This one billion population is made up of 70% youth. And one third of this is in the middle class. According to the United Nations, Africa's population is going to grow by 1.3 billion by 2050. So Africa is going to be an important marketplace in the 21st century. And this is the Africa rising narrative. I believe that the African rising narrative is a tech rising narrative. And I'll tell you why. <clears throat> in 1999, there were more landlines in the whole of Manhattan than Africa. Fast forward, by 2008, there were more cell phones in Africa than the whole of the United States. So within a decade, Africa actually leapfrogged the United States and went straight to mobile. Everybody was expecting Africa to industrialize, but she rather went straight into the information age. By 2014, as you see here, adult cell phone ownership in Africa was at par with the United States, countries like uh, South Africa, Ghana, and Kenya, to name a few. So cell phones became very pervasive in Africa and became the basis on which most Africans saw the internet. And therefore, Africa's experience of the information age is significantly different from what you see in the US. Most Africans are seeing the web for the first time on their cell phones, and that's quite important. This cell phone explosion was met by the development of submarine cables. In 2008, I was part of a team that built the first submarine cable to connect East Africa to the rest of the world. Before that, Africa had just one submarine cable. By 2014, there were about eight more submarine cables that had been built across the continent. These submarine cables connected to the mobile phones, and therefore most Africans started experiencing the internet through their mobile phones. So Africa is a mobile first, a mobile only, and a mobile web continent. This is quite significant because we began to see innovations in the mobile web space one of which is mobile money. Any of you heard of mobile money? OK, I'll tell you what it is. Now, in the West, most of you do your online transaction using credit or debit cards, because there is a system here that works. In Africa, you don't have that, because there's no credit system, and most addresses don't work. Because of that, it was impossible to implement a postpaid phone billing system. So Vodafone, Vodacom, sorry, the first uh, mobile operator in South Africa implemented what they call prepaid airtime. Basically, what it means is that you take cash, you go to a vendor, buy the airtime, load it on your phone, and then bingo, you can talk. Now, this is how most Africans were using their phone, by pre-buying the airtime and loading it onto the phone. Fast forward, in 2008, Safaricom, one of the leading mobile operators in Kenya, decided through SMS technology to convert that back into electronic value. So suddenly you had mobile money through their flagship product called M-Pesa. Essentially, what M-Pesa does is allow you to be able to do electronic transaction using the money that you've loaded onto your phone. And therefore, you were able to do electronic transactions and participate in the online economy. And this is how most Africans were transacting online. This is significantly different from here in the United States. Now, <clears throat> most of this innovation were being built by Africa's youthful generation, what you call Generation Z. 
And so most of these entrepreneurs were using mobile to solve problems in their societies. We began to see innovations in areas like security, in areas like transportation, finance, etc. So the invasion of mobile that we saw was not just in financial services. It started creeping into all kinds of sectors. One of my companies, for example, Farmerline, helps farmers to use mobile money to do transactions electronically and to access the global market. Until then, they couldn't do this. So mobile started impacting different parts of African society. And essentially, this is how the digital economy started emerging in Africa, led by the Generation Z that I talked about. According to Bloomberg, nowhere is this in impact most felt than in Ghana. In 2012, the value of products and services that are coming out of the information technology sector surged 239% in 2012. This is how much uh, ICT was contributing to the economy. And this actually improved Ghana's credit worthiness, as well as reduced its borrowing. In 2015, <coughs> the GSMA, which is the Global Association for Mobile Operators, conducted a survey looking at the impact of mobile in the global south. They concluded that while in Latin America it was 4% and in Asia Pacific it was 1.4%, in Africa the impact of mobile was 6% of GDP. That's how much mobile was making an impact in Africa. So we've had the impact side of it. In the same year, Another firm, a U.S. firm, this time called Freshfield, decided to look at the performance of 40 telecom, media, and technology companies across Africa from 18 countries. And they concluded that the annualized returns of these companies was at 19%. This is more than three times higher than oil and gas. And therefore, the ICT sector was outperforming the oil and gas sector as well as the Africa MSC index. So there's no way you can tell me that the Africa rising story is a resource narrative. It's got to be a tech narrative because the tech sector has been growing year on year since the last two decades that Africa adopted mobile. And we're going to see more innovations coming out of Africa because this is just the tip of the iceberg. What you've seen so far is what I call the connectivity era. We're now going to see the creativity era where the entrepreneurs are leveraging on this mobile web platform to create amazing technologies. And there are five countries that are actually leading this revolution across the continent that I would like to talk to you a little bit about today. So now let's see how well you know Africa. Ready for the test? Okay, so I call them the king's countries. We're going to use the positions and the flags to see how well you know Africa. So let's start with the one on the east. Which country is that? Oh, great, Kenya. So the first is K, Kenya. Um, the I, the one to the west, the stream west. Hello? Ivory Coast, yeah, somebody got it. Great, from the top, that's good. Okay, next to that is N. Oh, here we go. Everybody knows about Nigeria, great. <laughs> and then the next one is, if you don't get this, then I'll be very offended. <laughs> the G is which country? Because I told you that. <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, and the last one is? So these are the five countries that I, I call the Keynes countries. These are the countries leading the digital economy in Africa. And I came to a conclusion, not because it's a nice acronym, but actually through extensive research. And when I did the research, I came up with five characteristics that made this country stand out. The first is economic development. If you look over the last two decades, these five countries have had pretty steady economic growth between 2 to 8%. Of course, with some fluctuations here and there, we had a commodities crash and some countries suffered a little bit. But generally, Ghana, for example, this year is estimated to grow back at 8.4%. The second criteria is that the telecom sectors in these countries are very vibrant. If you take Ivory Coast, for example, there are four mobile operators effectively competing to provide services uh, to the consumers and enterprise. I already showed you the tech infrastructure. You saw the submarine and the terrestrial fiber cables circling the continent, which happened just in the last two decades. And then the fourth criteria is their entrepreneurial ecosystem. In each of these countries, you see an active participation of government, 
research, academia, and civil society in making innovations happen. And you need this collaboration to make sure that entrepreneurs can survive and thrive. The last um, uh, criteria, characteristic, is the supportive policies. So for example, in Ghana, the government set up what they call the Venture Capital Trust Fund, which is essentially to help activate the SME industry and startups by providing them capital, right? And we see this also in Kenya, where the government effectively bankrolled the submarine cable that we built. So these five characteristics make the king's country stand out. And I'll tell you certain things about them that, are, that make them unique. First is the Kenyan smoothness. I say Kenyan smoothness because today in Kenya, you can register a business, get a license, and do everything online sitting where you are right now. If you wanted to set up a business in Kenya, you can literally do it within a week online. The next is the Ivorian persistence. In the last two decades, I guess you guys have heard about Ivory Coast having some civil unrest, but the country has persisted back and been able to recover. Last year, Ivory Coast was growing at 8.1%, and this is a country that was in civil unrest just about four years ago. Any of you encountered a Nigerian before? <laughs> I think so. Yeah, I mean, I, I can't tell you much about the Nigerian hustle, right? A Nigerian can hustle something out of nothing. <laughs> and then there's the Ghanaian integrity, and finally, the South African diversity. I, I guess you've had the news uh, the last three days, South Africa you know, had a new president in a pretty democratic way. And I, I guess we've also seen some democratic transitions in the, um, Zimbabwe and Ethiopia also the last two days. So, so we're getting there. Um, so the South African diversity is, is, is very, very interesting uh, for the continent. So the Kings are a representation of Africa. First, Kenya represents East Africa. Ivory Coast represents the Francophone countries. Um, and these are the French-speaking countries. South Africa represents Southern Africa. Now, I'm going to tell you another very important fact, which is the ING, which is the name of the Dutch bank, and represents Ivory Coast, Nigeria, and Ghana. The population, the combined population of these three countries is about 300 million. That's about the size of the United States, the population of the United States. But sits on one fifth the landmass of West Africa. Remember the map that I showed you of the United States fitting to West Africa? So it means these three countries are the most close knit market in West Africa. And that's why West Africa is going to be a very, very important market to look at in the 21st century. Nigeria has produced Africa's fair unicorn. It's a company called Jumia. And Jumia is really growing very, very fast. So to conclude, I guess now you know how big Africa is. You didn't know that before. And you didn't know that Africa had so many cell phones than the United States. And so I think that Africa is going to be a very important player in the 21st century, leading a lot of the innovation that we see today. Um, I guess in many ways you miss Asia. Africa is where Asia was 20, 30 years ago. Africa is the new market for the 21st century. And Africa's innovation is led by the kings. Thank you.